Welcome to the Albuquerque Journal's Tech Outlook podcast. CNM is truly one college with infinite possibilities in tech and data sciences. CNM offers programs where everyone can learn about software, apps, or how to build websites. You can also choose from AI programs and machine learning, the Internet of Things, and so much more. CNM, one college, infinite possibilities, and the proud sponsor of the Tech Outlook podcasts. Welcome to another episode of Tech Outlook, a podcast from the Albuquerque Journal Business Desk. I'm Megan Gleason, a business reporter here at The Journal. Today we're diving into community solar, how it works and what's happening with it in New Mexico. With me to talk about this today is Kevin Cray, who's the Mountain West Senior Director for the Coalition for Community Solar Access, a national trade association that represents more than 100 community solar companies, businesses, and nonprofits. Kevin's been in the field of community solar for the last 10 years and had a hand in helping New Mexico's Community Solar Act come into fruition. Kevin, why don't you tell the viewers a little bit more about yourself? Hi to you, Megan. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Um, yeah, so I uh, originally started working on community solar uh, through a job with Excel Energy, managing uh, kind of their full suite of distributed energy programs across a variety of states and um, quickly honed in on really focusing on the community solar program. Um, had the opportunity to work on the Colorado program, which was really the original kind of true third party community solar program in the country, uh, helped launch and manage the Minnesota community solar program and worked on a variety of other utility products there. Um, in 2020, I made the jump over to the Coalition for Community Solar Access or CCSA and have had an opportunity to participate on the other side of the coin a little bit and learn um, a lot more from the, the industry perspective side of things and got to advocate for great community solar policies like the one that was enacted in New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's jump back and start from the very beginning. What exactly is community solar? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so community solar is typically a mid scale uh, distributed generation uh, solar array. Um, they're commonly one to five megawatts in size. And for uh, maybe a, a better perspective, looking at land use, that's about five to twenty five acres of land that um, the project would take up. Um, those projects inject energy directly into the distribution system to the local or host utility. Um, the host utility can then resell that power to local residents that live nearby um, at the full retail rate. And then um, on the back side, they provide monetary bill credits to the subscribing customers. And that's really what sets community solar apart um, from other you know, mid-scale DG um, is that it allows for um, a variety of residents, businesses uh, within the community to subscribe to the project who otherwise wouldn't have um, the ability to host an array on their own premise um, and receive those monetary bill credits so that they get to directly participate in the energy transition, um, get the financial benefits of doing so, um, even if they're not well positioned to, to host an array on their own. Yeah. And, and we're seeing this come to life with the new Community Solar Act, which lawmakers passed and the governor signed in 2021. Can you tell me about that law? Yeah, so it was a, a long time coming. I think the first community solar legislation was introduced in New Mexico back in 2013, if I uh, recall correctly, which was uh, far before my time working here. Um, but since then, uh, the coalition continued to build and become more and more robust. Um, I think there were pretty consistent attempts to enact community solar starting in 2019-ish. Um, in 2020, we had um, an opportunity to pass a Senate memorial, which created a working group um, and allowed for a variety of stakeholders to share their thoughts and opinions on what would be the best community solar legislation for New Mexico. Um, that ultimately led into a successful legislative push in the 2021 uh, legislative session to enact the Community Solar Act. Yeah. And what are what are the advantages and or disadvantages of community solar? From, from my perspective, the big advantage of the biggest advantage of community solar um, is the equity and access components that it provides to customers. Um, you know, there have been longstanding opportunities for um, you know wealthier folks that own their own home to install rooftop solar directly participate in the energy transition, receive the you know financial compensation for doing so. Um, the the group of the community community that was really getting left behind are those that are maybe a little bit less fortunate, don't own their home, live in an apartment, uh, maybe their home's not well situated for solar and therefore didn't really have any access to directly participate 
in the energy transition. And so community solar really levels the playing field across all those different constituencies and gives everyone kind of fair and equal access to participate to the extent that they want to. It remains a voluntary program. So it's really just um, for those customers that want to take that additional step um, towards participating, um, but by no means is a, a requirement to do so. Mm -hmm. And New Mexico is not the first state to try to do this kind of community solar work. How is it going in other states? It, it's going quite well. Um, community solar is the fastest growing segment of the renewable energy industry, and solar is the fastest growing, um, I guess, technology within the renewable energy space in the country today. Um, we're seeing just phenomenal growth across a variety of states. Um, I think there are 18 plus the District of Columbia that have enacted successful third party community solar programs. Uh, we see, you know, leading states like New York, New York, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, um, really paving the way and kind of putting in a lot of the fundamental capacity that it's continued to grow the industry. Um, I think we're seeing newer markets like um, Virginia and Maryland and New Mexico, um, California is kind of right on the, the cusp of re reformatting their community solar program to make it more successful, um, really kind of stepping in to continue the growth of the industry and provide uh, additional access really across the country. So um, I'm getting really excited about uh, additional opportunities to open up um, community solar markets across the Southwest, where I think there's just a great solar resource and ability to serve a lot of customers. Yeah. And where are we at here in New Mexico in the process of setting a community solar program up? Yeah, I mean, um, although the you know the Community Solar Act has been on the books for three years now, uh, we're still really much on the upswing of the kind of the the life cycle, as I'd call it, of community solar. So, um, a typical life cycle is to pass the enabling legislation, to go through a rulemaking process with the commission, which kind of took place over the calendar year um, 2021 into 2022, um, and then kind of get the initial program launch, which which um, Incline did through the issuing of the RFP in late 2022 into 2023, the awarding of projects. And so now um, we kind of have the full suite of projects awarded. Those projects are working through the interconnection process to ensure that they can be safely and reliably interconnected to the grid. And that will allow them to come online and start providing benefits to customers. So uh, I think we're right at a very exciting moment in time where we're starting to see projects really become real. We're starting to see the subscription drives um, kick off and starting to see a lot more engagement across the customer classes uh, throughout New Mexico. I think there's also a great opportunity ahead of us to continue to expand the program. The commission recently opened a new rulemaking uh, to intake kind of customer or uh, stakeholder input on you know potential rule changes, potential legislative changes, um, and then kind of potential evolutions to the program as they continue to look further out. And I'm really excited to see that kind of continuation of the industry so that we see it just continue to blossom, continue to provide opportunities for in-demand jobs, uh, customer savings and direct participation. Yeah, yeah. And in that input, some of the utilities and energy companies laid out some concerns they had with how community solar is rolling out. Can you speak to some of the challenges in setting up community solar? Yeah, uh, I think there are a variety of <clears throat> challenges that th uh, the industry tends to run into in standing up a new market. Um, when it comes to kind of vertically integrated utilities, um, you know, third party owned distributed generation resources tend not to comport as well with their business model as maybe other investments that they could make. Um, so there tends to be some natural friction between the industry um, and kind of some of the other stakeholders in the space. I think that, you know, getting through the interconnection challenges will be um, a really good step for the industry and um, really allow for the projects to become much more real and kind of be on a, a pretty firm trajectory towards their, um, I guess, coming into operation and providing the benefits that they can to the customers um, and providing the economic development benefits that we touted in a report that we rolled out to the legislature during the legislative process around some of the construction jobs and tangential jobs that will support the industry. 
So uh, moving forward from there, um, I think that we'll continue to see uh, just an expansion of the industry and, and more people getting an opportunity to participate and benefit. Um, I think some of the other concerns raised by particularly the utilities was around some of the credit rate aspects. Um, that was something that the legislature locked into um, for this kind of first we'll call it pilot program um, through 2024. But then the commission really has an opportunity to recommend changes to that whole valuation structure um, and kind of a lot of other fundamental changes to the program through a report to the legislature this November. So I think that'll provide a really key opportunity to potentially address some of those concerns. Um, CCSA laid out kind of a bit of a three-part vision for where we see the community solar program going in some of our initial comments to the commission. We hope that um, people can start to buy into that vision and kind of work towards that as a trajectory for community solar in the state. Yeah. And solar scams like rooftop solar can be an issue. So why should New Mexicans trust community solar? What kinds of safeguards are there around it? Yeah, I'd say the biggest kind of differentiating factor between a rooftop solar array and a community solar subscription is the existence of assets on the customer's premise. So if you have a rooftop solar array, um, you have, you know, whether it's your own owned asset or a leased asset from, um, you know, a leased provider such as Sunrun or Tesla or um, Sonova, somebody like that, then they have, um, you know, a potential to lean on the property if the customer, for whatever reason, is unable to make their payments. Um, community solar, on the other hand, is, is really more of a virtual transaction. And so to the extent that a customer no longer wants to participate or can't participate or moves, they're able to cancel their subscription, typically with a 30-day notice, no cancellation fees. Um, so it's really a, a bit more flexible product, in my opinion, to really kind of meet customers where they're at um, and provide them the opportunity to kind of step in or step out of a subscription as it makes sense for them in their um, current life situation. So um, I, I just think that there's, I guess, less overall exposure to customers participating in a community solar subscription model, um, just because again, they can kind of cancel. Um, whereas if they were to cancel with a rooftop solar provider, you know, there'd need to be things removed from their roof. They'd probably have to patch the roof from kind of some of the holes that might be up there. And so it's just a little bit more involved. Um, and I think that with in particular for income qualified communities where they might not have the sophistication to really think through the long-term implications of some of those contracts. Um, this provides just a lot more consumer protections to, to be flexible and, and it can move with them as well. So if they want to move across town, they can take their subscription with them. Whereas, you know, obviously moving a rooftop solar array is uh, significantly more um, involved. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of along the same lines, is there any misinformation around community solar that you'd like to address? I think there's a lot of, um, I guess, concern around kind of cross subsidization, the construction of the credit rates, how it may impact other customers. Um, I think a lot of that is really failing to account for um, a lot of the additional benefits that you see from DG through, you know, reduced transmission congestion, reduced transmission infrastructure investments, better use of the existing distribution assets, private investment to modernize the distribution grid to bring these projects online. Um, so I, I really do believe the, the overarching benefits of community solar far outweigh the costs and is a net positive to the, the community and the grid as a whole. Um, I'm hopeful that as people continue to get more comfortable with community solar and these mid-scale DG projects, that that kind of um, that thinking starts to evolve a little bit and we start to see um, a more accurate accounting of the benefits that community solar can bring to all customers. Um, and as we roll forward into the program, that kind of gets, um, I guess, incorporated into the considerations for the credit rates. In looking ahead, it's going to be an interesting few decades as New Mexico engages in a, a significant clean energy transition. How does community solar contribute to that? I see community solar as kind of, you know, filling in the gaps. Um, so you see large scale procurements through utility integrated resource plans um, that come online and, and they're a little chunky. Uh, they don't run those solicitations every year. It takes many more years for those projects to get um, through the interconnection process, to come to fruition, to get built. Um, and so community solar can kind of keep the general trajectory toward the energy transition going. So it can kind of fill in some of the gaps. CCSA worked with Vibrant Clean Energy to um, conduct a study um, looking at kind of the national energy outlook. And what it found was by prioritizing 
you know, somewhere in the 10 to 12 percent of DG range, um, we can actually get to the lowest cost overall grid. And that's by reducing, you know, costly investments in transmission, overbuilding natural gas peaker plants and really smoothing out the, uh, the energy load curves across the states. And so um, I'm excited to see community solar really help to facilitate that role in New Mexico and accelerate the adoption of DG across the state. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to watch it all roll out. I think that's all the time we have for today. But Kevin, thank you so much for being here and telling us about Community Solar. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Megan. Of course. Um, Tech Outlook comes out every Monday afternoon. Um, but otherwise, I hope you've learned a lot about Community Solar. And until next time, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.